is always the word experiment. Like the idea they might have more casualties or fewer casualties, but the data is going to be really rich. That's the important thing. So I'd like to see less of this in the world um, and a little bit more of that. <laughs> and if the standard of road science has risen by that level by the time I retire, then I can die a happy man. That's a good thing. Um, so that's a little bit about what I'm interested in doing. Basically, I'm here to make sure that the quality of the writing that we do is generally pretty good and to hopefully make people feel more comfortable and confident in the writing that they do at Monzo as well. Um, and this evening, for about the next 20, 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about these three things. Uh, one is why it is that business writing in general, but also finance and bank writing in particular, is the way that it is. And just to set the scene up front, I think, broadly speaking, we can all agree that it's not the most fantastic writing that any companies ever do. Um, if anyone feels differently, then we can talk about it after. Um, so talk about that first, why it is the way it is, some of the history behind why that is the way that it is. Uh, and then the chunky bit is why that matters. So actually, what difference does it make if our writing is a bit long and complicated, if it's a bit formal, if it doesn't really connect with our audience? Why does that have an impact on us as a bank, on banks in general, and also on the customers that we're trying to help? Uh, and last but not least, at Monzo, what it is that we're trying to do about it, um, how we're approaching uh, trying to tackle that problem in a company that's growing really fast, where we've got lots of moving parts, how do we deal with that? And there'll be time for questions at the end, I hope. Um, if I'm running over, Najee's going to give me the signal, so we should be fine. Um, so to start, why business writing is the way that it is. Um, go back in time a couple of thousand years uh, to Roman Britain. This is what happens if you Google Roman Britain. Um, Romans arrived a couple of thousand years ago in Britain, and they bring with them the language Latin because that's where they're from. Uh, and all the local tribes at the time are speaking some variation of Germanic English. Do the Romans go, fantastic, we will integrate and learn your ways and become part of your culture? No, they don't. They're the Romans. You've got big pointy sticks. So you have to learn Latin or you get stuffed, basically. So all the local tribes start to adopt Latin, uh, and it becomes the language of the elite, the same as it is for the Romans themselves. And that, over time, becomes the de facto language of religion and administration, which is why words like de facto and religion and administration are all Latin root words. And my language is still full of Latin to this day. Because even after the Romans leave, that Latin sticks around and it stays as part of our culture and actually people in charge use it as a way of enforcing the social hierarchy. We know something you don't. You don't even get a Bible in English until the century, which is a lot later. <laughs> I should have picked it up. It's 15 something. If someone knows, then they can help me out. 15 something, there's not even a Bible in English until then. All the important things that are done in writing are done in Latin and common folks just have no idea what's going on. And that is deliberate. That is on purpose. And after the Romans leave, that happens. And the only things that are getting written down at this point are binding things, contracts of some kind, wedding contracts, business contracts, stuff like that. So legal writing comes from Latin. And if anyone here is a lawyer or has ever done anything with any lawyers before, you will know that to practice law today, you still have to know an awful lot of legal terminology, legal terms and phrases. That is slowly being shifted out as time moves on, but basically it's still there. And even until a couple of hundred years ago, once we have the legal system all set up, most of us still would have probably been illiterate. We didn't really need to write for our jobs if we were seamstresses or soldiers or carpenters or farmers or whatever it might be, most of us didn't need to write. So still, the only writing that really got done was legally binding. It came from law and it was from that basis of Latin. And so the modern kind of uh, foundations on which all business writing rests, it's modern business, um, is basically from that Latin root, from that legal writing root. And what we think of as professional writing, when we think of professional writing as opposed to casual writing or informal writing, is largely based out of words that come from the Latin side of our language, the written side of our language, as opposed to Anglo-Saxon English, which is what I'm using now when I talk to you. And that kind of leaves us in a slightly weird situation, because you end up writing a lot of things that you tend not to ever actually say. So you'll be talking about things like providing things and requesting things and necessitating aforementioned documentation when you would never use those words out loud. You tend not to walk around saying, I'm just going to the shops. Do you require anything? Yes, going forward, I require a Twix. <laughs> it's not an exchange people tend to have. And that's the difference between the written, spoken, the, the written language that we use that comes from Latin, the professional idea of what language is, as opposed to the spoken language that we use, which is much more natural and conversational. So that's one of the reasons why businesses write the way that they do. It's on that foundation of professional writing, which comes from the foundation of legal writing, which comes from Latin. And what we're doing when we use that stuff is sounding professional, we think, but also we're perpetuating unconsciously that bias of we know something you don't, which is why quite often when businesses are 
talking to you, it feels like they're talking down to you. And also why our writing gets more formal, the worse news we give, because it's more hierarchy. We're getting higher up that chain and further away from the people we're trying to engage with. That's one reason. The other reason, well, there's a bunch of reasons, but the other reason I'm going to talk about now um, is something this guy came up with. His face is very big on that screen, I've realised now. This is Stephen Pinker. Some of you, I'm sure, are very familiar with him. Um, he is a sociologist and psychologist. He's written a bunch of very smart books about words. Um, and he has an idea called the curse of knowledge, which is essentially that the more you know about a topic and the more of an expert you are on it, and the more you're surrounded by people who are experts in that same topic every day, which in a finance technology company is kind of compounded, um, the harder it is for you to bridge the gap to what other people on the outside don't understand. And businesses in general, but especially banks where it gets more technical, and especially financial technology companies, which pretty much every bank nowadays is, have a real problem with this. We end up using terminology that people just don't understand. Most of it we're aware of, well, some of it we're aware of. Internally, we have an issue with talking about uh, presentment versus authorization, which is the two different stages in a financial transaction, which we are well aware that people on the outside don't understand. So we make an effort to explain that stuff. But also, there are words that we don't even realize become jargon, become part of our own internal language and seep out into the world. Words like funds, which if you work in any kind of finance business, you're probably like, yeah, funds. People talk about funds all the time. No one in the world outside of a financial services company has ever said, are you going to the pub? Yeah, I'm just going to withdraw some funds. It's not the language that we use. And it's only a small thing, but not being aware of it is a symptom of the bigger problem. And sooner or later, we start talking about things like proof of funds. And then customers say, what the hell is proof of funds? And this is literally stuff that customers say to us quite regularly. Um, because this is our jargon that we're using internally because we are suffering from that curse of knowledge in the same that every other business is as well. And banks especially suffer from this stuff because of that concentration of technical knowledge in small teams uh, and a long history of just doing it the way they've always done it. So that's part of the reason why businesses write the way they do and banks especially. The fact that we have this concentration of technical knowledge that we find hard to translate to the outside world. We always overestimate how much people on the outside understand of what we're saying. Um, but that applies within businesses as well, actually. Internally within businesses, you'll get one team using terms that others don't understand. And we tend not to be very willing to go, hello, I'm very ignorant. Can you explain what you mean? We just tend to go, all right, and hope somebody will explain it later on, and it just gets worse and worse. That's part of the reason. And then we're compounding that because we are using this professional English, which is from that Latin root, which is basically a bit more longer and complicated than it needs to be. Um, so that's the reason why it is the way it is. Is that actually such a problem? I guess it's a fair question um, that I'm asking you to answer for myself. Um, why is it such a problem? Finance is complex. Should we not talk about it in complex ways? Can we talk about it in simple ways without losing credibility? That's one question. The other question is, what do we lose if we don't? Like, if our writing stays complicated and technical, then what's the downside to that? You know, we are banks. That's what banks have traditionally done. What are we going to lose? Um, there's a couple of problems with that. First is that we don't trust banks, generally. Uh, in fact, there was a YouGov survey from May last year which found that only 36% of people in Britain trust that their bank is operating in their best interests, which is a pretty damning result, even you know, 10 years after the financial crisis and all the changes that banks supposedly went through and ring fencing and all the other stuff that goes on. Um, only 36% of us trust that banks are operating in our best interests. Obviously, a lot of that has to do with actions, things that banks have or haven't done in the past crashing the world economy and so on. Um, but it also, there is a direct link between how you communicate and how people feel about you and how much they trust you as well. Um, to give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, there's a guy that I'm sure some of you in the audience are going to be familiar with called Daniel M. Oppenheimer. Um, still my favourite name in academic research. He was at Princeton now, I think he's at Yale. And he's interested in this link between how you communicate in writing and how people feel about you. Do they like you? Do they trust you? So he did some research. Uh, he went out to about a thousand people and he showed them seven versions of the same argument, the same complex technical explanation. But he'd written that seven different ways, from very, very complicated double PhD, because he's like a really smart person, down through grades of complexity to very clear, simple, if you hit this sign, you will hit that bridge type language. Um, and he went to a thousand people and said, which one of these seven different authors, explaining this idea in their own way, do you, do you trust the most? Do you think is the most credible? Do you think is the most intelligent? Um, hands up, please, if you think it was the top end, the most complicated end. One person, two people, three people, four people, okay. Uh, hands up, if you think it was the simplest end, the bottom end of that spectrum. Slightly more people, 20, 30-ish people. Hands up, if you think it was somewhere in the middle or it really depended on your opinion. Okay, that's broadly the majority. And then a lot of people who clearly work in finance who are like, I'm hedging my bets. <laughs> that's fine. 
Um, it was an absolute landslide for the simplest version, like hardly anyone voted for anything else. And he called that piece of research the consequences of erudite vernacular utilised irrespective of necessity, <laughs> or the problems with using long words needlessly. Um, you can Google this if you Google however many of those words you can be bothered to Google, it will come up, um, and you can read it, and it is freely available. I wouldn't bother, because he didn't take any of his own medicine, and it's actually quite needlessly complicated. Um, but the findings are sound, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that if you can take a complicated idea and express it clearly and simply, you kind of have to know your stuff. Anyone can waffle on for nine pages about something without getting to the point. That doesn't really take any foresight or planning. But if you can take something big and pair it back to its essential so anyone can get it, you have to know it inside out. And we respond to that. You know, you think of people like Warren Buffett and Elon Musk and Brian Cox, the scientist, not the actor, and Barack Obama and people like that. They don't get up on stage and we go, you must be dumb because you said something simple. We go, wow, you must really get it. And we respond to that in writing as well. The second thing that's going on is there's a credibility gap. You know, if I can't understand what you're saying, how can I really be sure that you understand what you're saying? We've all had communications from companies, and this is where the trust thing for banks especially comes in. Communications from companies, sometimes our own companies, where you know they're not quite saying something. And is it because they can't say it, or because they don't want to say it, or because they're being deliberately complicated to try and pull the wood over my eyes somehow? I actually read a study a couple of weeks ago where Standard & Poor's, the ratings agency, had done some research into um, companies' quarterly profit warnings. So the things they publish from senior management before the actual numbers come out. And they found a direct correlation between the more complicated the language was in that profit warning, the worse the numbers were about to be. And the simpler the language, the better the numbers were about to be. Because the senior management were going, well, we better bury this under a load of rubbish because we know it's going to be bad. And that's kind of how we feel about complicated language as well. We don't really necessarily naturally trust it. We tend to prefer things which are clear and simple and talk to us in a way we can understand because we can understand it, first of all. And second of all, we relate to things that relate to us. Um, that's the first reason. There is a link between language and trust, and if we don't care about the language we're using with other audiences, why should they bother to pay attention to what we're saying in the first place? Second reason is basically the FCA tell us we have to, um, whether we like it or not. Naturally, we do like it anyway, but it's good that they are on the same page. Um, they say that our language has to be clear, fair, and not misleading. Our communications have to be all three of these things. And if we're using a term like proof of funds with people who don't really understand what that is, we're not really hitting any of those points. It's not clear or fair because people don't necessarily understand what it means. It feels like jargon because it is. And it certainly is not misleading because if anyone isn't familiar with what proof of funds means, it doesn't necessarily mean what you think it does. It doesn't necessarily mean proof that you have enough money. It can also mean proof that you just own this account. So when a bank asks you for proof of funds, it might just mean that they need to know that you own the account that you're talking about, which has nothing to do with funds. It's complete jargon. So when we use terms like that, we're not hitting these marks that the FCA say we have to use. So we have to make our language clearer and more effective for that reason. Um, the third reason is that if, from a selfish point of view, as the company is sending this stuff out into the world, if we don't make an effort to make it engaging and interesting and clear, then people just won't bother. Um, again, somebody I'm sure you're very familiar with, uh, Daniel Kahneman, one of the kind of founding fathers of behavioral economics with his business partner Amos Tversky. Um, this is a great book, by the way, if no one's ever read it, you should definitely read it, it's really good. Um, he has a theory called Fast and Slow Thinking, which explains how we like or don't like to engage with information. Basically, the difference is, something like that is an example of fast thinking. You can't help but have the answer in your head straight away. It's really easy, it's really quick, you just get it, it doesn't take any effort on your part. Whereas if I put that up, unless Carol Vorderman snuck in, no, she never comes. And this kind of is like, you're not going to bother trying to do that. You're just going to go, well, that seems too hard. People, when they're confronted with complicated things, don't go, I'd better roll my sleeves up and get stuck in. They go, oh, I wonder what's on Instagram. <laughs> and that is the same with finance. It's the same with numbers. It's also the same with information that we provide to you. If we were to suddenly dump 900 pages of terms and conditions on you, you wouldn't read it. And no one does read it. And we know that from research that we've done and research the FCA has done. So if we're producing lots of stuff and it's complicated, then we're not doing ourselves any favours because we know that people aren't going to engage with it. Um, the reason traditionally that businesses do that is because they feel like it protects them. Like the FCA did some research a few years ago, a thematic review into terms and conditions, and they found massive over-disclosure of terms and conditions from the firms they regulate. Um, none of the firms they regulate, this is almost directly quoting from their findings, none of the firms they regulate could prove that actually made them safer, but it definitely meant a loss of trust in terms of the audiences they were talking to. Um, and actually another interesting example of that from a few years ago in the States, there was a guy who signed up for a dating website which was quite niche, 
Um, and he started getting emails from a bunch of other dating websites that he had nothing to do with, or he felt like he had nothing to do with. Um, so he contacted the company and said, what's going on here? And they said, well, we're part of a network, and once you give us your email address, we pass it to the other companies in the networks, fairly standard stuff. He said, well, I did not sign up for that. And they said, well, actually, it's on paragraph 904, subsection 63 of the terms and conditions, so he did. And he said, well, that doesn't make any sense. There's me and a bunch of other people in the same situation. We're going to sue you. And they did. And between them, they won $16.5 million in damages from that company because the judge said, obviously, no one read those terms and conditions. They're a nonsense. So the idea that having the stuff in writing keeps us safe is just kind of being shifted away. The FCA handling company is pretty hard for the stuff at the moment over here as well as in the States. It's not the FCA over there. So that's reason number three. Um, reason number four is that actually the language that we use just it has a bigger impact necessarily than people realize. Um, another thing that you've already heard of before probably, nudge theory. Um, this guy, Richard Thaler, and a few other people. Richard Thaler used to work with Tversky and um, uh, Kahneman on like, the birth of behavioral economics. And there was a nudge unit, otherwise known as the Behavioral Insights Team, set up inside David Cameron's government, first of all, I think it was. Basically, the theory is that what changes people's behavior and the way they think isn't one big off, big one-off interventions. It's lots of small little changes, little nudges that push people in a certain direction. So for the Behavioral Insights team, they were trying to do things like uh, make people register to vote, to pay their council tax on time, to renew their car tax, stuff like that. So they did little experiments changing small things that would try and radically change people's behavior. So for the car tax, they found that if they uh, put the make of your car, wrote the make of your car in the letter when they sent it to you, changed nothing else, twice as many people would pay on time. And if they put the name of the car and also a picture of the make of your car in the letter, three times as many people would pay their car tax on time, just by those small little changes. Uh, and for the council tax one, they, I think it was 15%, they got a 15% better response in council tax returns by adding one sentence to the letter they sent out. And that one sentence was, Nine out of ten people in Britain pay their council tax on time. Um, small little nudge to push people in a certain direction. Hopefully you will realise from this, this is a language thing. This is words they're using to nudge people. Because they don't really talk about it in a lot of detail in the book or many books on nudge I've read, but every word that we use is a small nudge in one direction or another, whether we realise it or not. That's especially important for a business like ours where we're a digital bank. We're pretty much only on your phone. We don't have any branches. Um, you can phone us. There are some people on the phone, but pretty much everything we do is going to be words that you see on a teeny tiny little screen. At biggest, it'll be a screen that size. So every word that goes on there is kind of worth more to us because you're not going to be exposed to as many of them. And if we're not making it clear to you why you should pay attention, then you're not going to pay attention. And if you're using terminology you don't understand, then you're going to turn off before you've even started. Ideally, you'll almost never talk to us. Ideally, you'll just look at the phone and go, yeah, that's my money, it's great, and it works, and not ever have to worry about it. So in those few seconds of interaction, what we do is a very important nudge one way or another. So we have to think about it in terms of what's going to attract you and keep your attention. We've also got a responsibility not to mislead you or unduly influence you in one direction or another. You know, our like, big long-term goal is to have a billion customers. If we end up with a billion customers, that's an awful lot of money, an awful lot of people that we're influencing one way or another. And the language that we use is going to have an impact, and words have more power than people tend to realize. Um, an example of that, um, a few years ago, there was a woman called Lyra Boroditsky. She's a researcher, well, she was a researcher at Stanford. Um, she did an experiment. She got two groups of people, and she said to one of those groups, you are now the crisis management team uh, responsible for the fictional city of Addison, and there is a problem in your town. Uh, crime is spreading through the city like a virus. I would like you please to go away and come up with some solutions to that problem. So off they went. Then she went to the other group and said, you have a problem. You are now the crisis management team of the fictional city of Addison, uh, but crime is preying on your city like a beast. I would like you please to go away and come up with solutions to that problem. And when the two groups came back, the team that she'd sent off to think about it in terms of a virus suggested things like social reform, better education, community engagement. And the people she'd sent off to think about it in terms of praying like a beast came back with tougher sentencing, more police on the streets, harder sentencing, crackdowns. And she thought, that's interesting. And no matter how she split the groups, by age or gender or political leaning or background, whatever it might be, whether she'd said, spread like a virus, or pray like a beast, was almost twice as likely to influence how they would come up with solutions, whether they realised it or not. A couple of extracts from that bit of research. So even a single word can have a powerful, uh, powerful influence over how people attempt to solve social problems like crime and how they give information. And the really worrying bit is that people do not recognise 
these words as influential in their decisions. They think they're making decisions based on some numbers. But the only thing that's changing is the language they're being exposed to. And this kind of thing happens all the time. It's called framing. It's thing that journalists do all the time. It's a thing that politicians do all the time. Uh, it's a thing that businesses do all the time. And if we're not careful, we can be doing it with whether we realize it or not. So we have to be really crucially aware of the kind of language we use. If we launch some kind of lending product, how do we describe that? How do we describe the terms of it? What do we talk about in terms of paying it back? Do we call it lending or borrowing? What influence does that have on how people approach it? What does that mean about how we feel about it internally? And also internally, how do we talk about the people we're serving? Are they customers? Are they users? If we use one word over another, what does that mean about how we think about them? What does that mean about what we're trying to do and who we're trying to serve? All of this stuff seems pedantic and small, but cumulatively, like all those theories and to nudge theory, it makes a big difference to how we're thinking about what we're doing. So paying attention to the small details of our language is really, really crucially important. Um, so that's the main reasons, really, why I think it matters, the main reasons I've got time to talk about now. Um, we have trust is kind of everything that we've got. We are a startup bank. We are certainly not too big to fail. You know, if we go under the bank, uh, the government isn't going to come in and bail us out. So trust is pretty much all we have. And if our writing isn't engaging the people that we're trying to get to and convincing them they should stick with us, even if every so often there's an outage, even if every so often the new product we release isn't perfect first time it comes out of the shop, then we're basically dead in the water. So our language has to do a lot of heavy lifting there. Um, we know from research and experience that if we produce loads of stuff, just because we've produced loads of stuff doesn't mean people are paying any attention. It's kind of the opposite. There's kind of a direct correlation between the more you give people to read and the less they actually want to read. So we have to be really clear about what we mean, which means we have to care about the language we're using. And lastly, we don't have many words to make a difference, and those words can make a difference that we might not be aware of. So we have a duty to be careful about the terms we use and not chuck around language that makes sense to us, but doesn't mean anything to people on the outside. Um, so that's all very well. Those are the reasons why it matters. Um, what are we actually trying to do about it? Um, so the first thing we've done to try and do something about it, or the first thing in my time here, um, is to put actually what our values are in writing down into some guidelines. Uh, and they're actually live today. They actually went live today. If you go on monzo.com and scroll down to the bottom, they will be there in the little banner at the bottom. There's a blog about it as well. Um, and they are great, and they look a little bit like this, or part of them looks a little bit like this, anyhow. Um, and they are obviously great. It's nice to have guidelines, but the guidelines are kind of the start of the journey, not the end of it. On their own, they don't really do anything. Lots of companies have tone of voice guidelines, and they go fantastic and put them in a drawer and never look at them ever again. Um, they are the start of the journey. They're kind of the bricks. And then from that, we have to build something, and then other people come along and tell us whether it's any good or not. So the guidelines are great, but they're the first stage. They're kind of like, OK, now we're here. What do we do with this thing? Next thing we're doing is a hell of a lot of training. Um, so it's not really a sustainable option if you have a couple of writers in a business and every time it grows a bit you hire a bunch more writers. It's a much better option if everybody internally just gets better at writing as we go along. Um, also it means that people are more engaged in it and that you don't have to have so much policing going on of what's going on. So we run training sessions internally so that everybody, not just people in marketing or not just people in customer service, can be more confident and comfortable with the writing that they're doing. Um, so that they can just be responsible for their own stuff. Everyone here pretty much has autonomy to do what they want to do. Everyone here, whether they think of themselves as one or not, is a writer, because pretty much everyone is a writer now. We all start every day by writing on a laptop, and that's pretty much all we do. So they need to be better at this stuff. They need to be more confident at this stuff. So that's what we're doing there. Um, the third thing you do is actually making it true as well, because it's all very well having a set of guidelines and then running a bunch of training sessions, if then everyone turns around and the next thing they see that we've actually written is just a load of waffly nonsense that no one wants to read. So we actually have to make it true and as much as possible do it everywhere. So it's all very well having, you know, like I said, the training and the guidelines and then some nice adverts that might go out or some nice emails that might go out. But if we're not doing it in the nooks and crannies, in the little dark bits that no one ever pays any attention to, like the terms and conditions, or the error messages that pop up on the app, and the stuff like that that you don't expect companies to work so hard on, then it isn't really true. And people tend to feel like that about brands anyway, that it isn't really true. Actually, I'm going to do an experiment now. I've never actually done it before, so if it backfires, then I don't really know what's going to happen. But uh, can you put your hand up, please, if you've ever joined a company or started being a customer of a company because of an advert you saw of theirs? Okay, can you well, keep them up for a minute, please? Sorry. And then put your hand down if you did that because of a financial incentive in that advert. There was an offer on. Okay, some people still got their hands up. It's around about what? 
30 people maybe? Thank you very much. Okay, now hands up this time if you have stopped being a customer of, of a company because of a bad experience you had with them in terms of some communications or some like feedback or a complaint that you handled. Okay, that's pretty much everyone. Now, can you keep your hands up or put your hands up again if it's easier? If that was still nothing to do with actually losing money, it was just a crap experience. Pretty much everyone, right? We don't really give a shit about marketing. <laughs> we form our experiences of what companies are like based on the quality of the experiences when it goes wrong. Like, it's going back to uh, Tversky and Kahneman, one of the things they proved is that we have loss aversion. We are much more worried about losing stuff than we are about gaining stuff. We hate losing more than winning, and it's the same with like complaints. We form stronger opinions about companies when things go wrong than when they go well. So it's crucially important that this everywhere bit is true for the writing that we do. Like it has to be on our terms and conditions, it has to be on our risk policies, it has to be when we're chasing debt. Because if it's not there, those are the bits where people really form opinions about what we're like. As thankfully you just proved and I don't look quite as stupid as I would have done otherwise. Um, so to that end, here is a tiny extract of our 800 world terms and conditions. Um, if you go on the website, the current account that I hope most of you folks have, um, this is part of the terms and conditions. It's 800 words long. It is readable by an 11-year-old. Um, and we actually got it re-awarded a few days ago by a company called Fairer Finance, who go around checking about the quality of writing that financial companies do. And they said, yes, this is clear and simple. Gave it the mark. Um, so we think it's great. They also think it does the job it's supposed to do. Um, and I think that stuff is at least as, if not more important, than the things you might see in the emails that we send you that encourage you to upgrade, all that kind of thing. Because this is the true bit about where we say, these are the values we have, here they are in practice. We don't just run away from them just because now it's getting technical. Um, and the last thing we're doing, or will be doing mostly, is actually seeing if this makes any difference, measuring the impact that this has. Like words and writing and language in general tend to get pigeonholed as the thing that, well, that's nice and people feel better about it, but it doesn't actually make a difference. Um, in my old life, I used to be a consultant and do a lot of measuring this stuff. I'd like to do the same thing here. Um, so the difference it makes in terms of how many people are encouraged to upgrade, and if you haven't upgraded, the deadline is the fourth and you should do it. Um, and how much difference it makes in terms of how people find it easy to navigate the help section of the app and how many people need to go and talk to one of our amazing customer service people because they couldn't find the information they were looking for elsewhere. All those things are examples of where we can nudge people in the right direction by being a bit smarter about the language that we use. And that is it. Thank you very much. Any questions? We got one down the front? Just shout. Just shout. Just shout. Just okay. shout. So you mentioned that um, you think internally whether you think of your, if you think of us as users or clients. Yeah. Could you tell us? How yeah. You, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping no one would ask that. <laughs> yeah, users or customers was the debate we had internally, not clients. Clients didn't come up, yeah. So I, I did a little poll internally, because internally different teams seem to say users, some say customers, and sometimes we say mums and orts in general, which is what we internally call ourselves at Munzo, when it was a debate of, well, since we're supposedly all in this together, then maybe we should all be mums and orts. Honestly, we didn't quite settle on one or the other. Um, it feels like there are different times when it's appropriate to say customers and different times it's appropriate to think about people as users. Like, uh, personally, my completely subjective preference is for users. I feel like customers is more transactional. But then other people have said the exact opposite. I don't, I don't think there is a right answer with that, really. But surfacing the debate was really interesting because it made a bunch of people go, oh, I didn't realize I had this bias where I was thinking of us in terms of being a tech company. Um, so a lot of engineers were saying, we don't say users because that's a tech company thing, we're a finance company, we have customers. But people who didn't have a tech background didn't see that distinction. But it was interesting to make those two people talk to each other and go, oh, I didn't realise I was thinking about it that way. So the answer is, I don't know, it changes. <laughs> Hi, yeah, please. Yeah, so we do a lot of A-B testing on the emails and stuff that we send out, um, stuff, updates on the community and things like that. Uh, we also do user testing where we have uh, people come in and spend a day kind of going through app flows and product designs and stuff like that where I will sit in on that stuff or at least get the results back and go, okay, that's interesting. And that's really interesting partly in the way that people actually interact with the app but also partly in terms of how they're verbalizing what they're doing as they go through, the language that they use as they go through, that throws up as much stuff as them actually going through the app does. Yeah? Is there a fear that like, there's a certain demographic that is like, slightly more averse to emojis and like, the way you speak that you might be losing out on their business? Like, 
as in, I'm not going to make any assumptions about what that generation yeah. or demographic may be, yeah, but yeah. like some people would definitely be uncomfortable having spent years of, like, years as clients in traditional banks and stuff. Like, do you feel that they're not used to this kind of uh, way of speaking and they'd be like, like averse to signing up to Monza because of this? Yeah. So there's a couple of things though. One is that when you have any kind of a brand that leaves the beige center ground, some people won't come with you, and that's kind of the price you pay for distinctiveness. And the people who do come with you will really come with you. If you try and please everyone, you will please no one, but they'll all be like, yeah, that's fine. It's kind of a wallpaper thing, um, which I don't think we want to be. The second thing is kind of what noted Nazi Henry Ford said, which is that if I'd have asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. So if we want to shift the paradigm, we can't go, well, everyone else is doing it. If everyone else is doing it, that's a pretty good indication that maybe we shouldn't be, especially if, generally speaking, we don't think the industry is as efficient or innovative as it should be. Um, not here, but in my old previous life as a consultant, I'd worked with a bunch of slightly more traditional insurance companies. We did tons of user testing. Um, and basically, no demographic we ever came across actually preferred things to be more formal and complicated. There were a bunch of people who said, I was a bit shocked by it because I didn't expect it from an insurance company. But nobody ever said, actually, I don't understand it now. Everyone said, well, it's clearer. I just didn't maybe expect it. And then when we said, well, would you use us? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, so I've not come across that group yet. Other people might, but I've not. Yes, so please. The of writing that falls outside email and ad campaigns and DMs, all the stuff you mentioned in the mix of credits. Yeah. It's really interesting to see, to, to, to see how you As a measure if it's doing the job. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's kind of blunt force things like readability. So when Farrah Finance came back and looked at our terms and conditions, stuff like that, they would put it through a, a kind of a blunt force readability thing. So a readability checker is basically a, a not very sophisticated algorithm that checks how easy is your writing to understand first time. There's one called Flesh Kincaid that's quite famous, or Gunning Fog, or what the other ones are. There's a few of them around. Um, and things like Grammarly will use those and a few other things on top as the basis of what they're doing to say, is this writing good or not? And it'll spit out a score, and the better the score, the better the easier your writing is to read first time. It doesn't tell you if it's any good, or if it's legally sound, or if it's interesting or funny, but it does tell you, kind of, if your score is not good, you know that your writing isn't clear. If your score is good, it doesn't tell you it's good writing. You see what I mean? Um, so that's some of the stuff that we do for those things. Otherwise, it's kind of, well, how many complaints or confused people come into customer service off the back of not understanding something in the terms and conditions. It's kind of soon to say what the impact of that is, because we've only just relaunched them, but that is one of the things I would like to go back and look at, yeah. Yes, mate. Oh, sorry, yeah. So the question there was how do we measure things which are kind of outside of the, the straightforward stuff that we can get a metric on, like emails and stuff on the website? How do we measure how much impact we've had when we simplify a thing like terms and conditions where re reading like page views doesn't really tell us much about it? How do we measure the impact of that? So the first question there was, um, what is it? Sorry, I can't remember what the first question is. <laughs> my mind feedback. Yes, feedback from customers, yeah. So what kind of results have we had and feedback have we had and how have we made tweaks off the back of those things? Um, well, when, I, when we were putting together the tone of voice this time, it was more a case of going, what do we do already and codifying that on paper? I've only been here for a few months, so everything that people think of as the Monzo brand and tone of voice and personality is kind of already there. It was just, let's write that down then. Um, and in that process, we went and asked the community, what do you think of our writing now? Um, and pretty much everyone said, yeah, we really like it. Uh, pretty much everyone said it, it does the things that you think it should do. It's helpful and friendly. Um, the one thing that kept coming back again and again was, we like emojis, we think emojis are good, but maybe pump the brakes a bit on the emojis, just a little, every now and then. So off the back of that, we thought internally, okay, well, so what do we do about emojis? And we kind of rethought what the default position is for them and did part of the training now, especially for people in customer service, is just to be a little bit more thoughtful about that stuff um, and not default to them. Because internally, we're just emoji mad, like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, and sorry, the second question was um, what makes us distinctive from the other challenger banks, right, in terms of the language we use. Um, honestly, I think most tech companies, the most young tech companies, pretty much all sound the same way. We've all got this kind of friendly, open thing. I think, hopefully, the distinction is, and to be honest, I don't know enough because I don't see enough of their writing on the inside. I would hope that what differentiates us and will differentiate us is the doing it everywhere thing. Because there's no company in the world I've ever come across that writes really well everywhere all the time. And there's no reason for that, except not enough people care. You know, there's no legal reason we have to write a certain way. There's no professional business reason we have to write a certain way. It's just tradition and inertia. Um, so I would like to think that those terms and conditions um, are more readable than you would find in other challenger banks. I don't know of any of the others that have had fairer finance awards or of similar kinds of awards. I don't know. I genuinely don't. Um, I would like to think as well that the kind of training that we do internally and the support that we have internally is going to keep us a cut above in that sense. In terms of distinctiveness, I think a more interesting distinction would be the things that we do and don't talk about, like what a newspaper might call their editorial position. Um, and hopefully we will be able to differentiate ourselves in terms of those things versus some of the others. Um, what that might actually be, I don't know. I've only been here a few months. Um, but I think those would be the two things. I don't think anyone wants a bank that is wildly mad in terms of their tone of voice. I've not seen any evidence of that. Um, but they do want people to be doing it everywhere all the time. Otherwise they go, well, it's just a, a veneer, isn't it, really? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, to be honest. No, not really. I don't know enough about it, to be honest, to give a proper, considered view. From As a person who might be a customer or exposed to all three, like us and Sterling and Revolut and Atom and the others, I, not really. We all use emojis. It's all very friendly. You know. I would, look, I would go, if, to do an interesting experiment, would be to go and look at the terms and conditions for all four. Because at the front bit, everyone writes well in marketing. You know. Uh, yes, please. Uh, what skills do people have in, for, uh, to work on this, like linguistics, legal, authors, like which kind of people are working on this and are they in-house or do you hire them uh, externally with you or so? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't particularly have to have any except kind of an interest in it and then kind of a knack for the good writing like pretty much everyone is a pretty good writer we all intuitively know a lot about a lot about what makes for good writing we just have a lot of biases and professional kind of monkeys on our shoulder that get in the way you know if you say to somebody so okay what would you what are you trying to say there and they say it you go well write that down that was most of my job for about six years um but the, the thing that you need to do this kind of thing is just kind of an openness to the feedback, the same things that would make you a good kind of empathetic person, really. Um, I don't have any background in linguistics or law. We have some other writers here. Some of them studied English, but nobody's kind of got a really intensely linguistic background. Um, it helps, like, if you are a lawyer who is a good writer, that is a fantastic combination. We have some of those. Um, but there's no particular set of skills that you need, I don't think. Yeah. So the question there is, if somebody or some people come back and say to us, this email isn't working, or this communication isn't working, how quickly and easily can we shift? Uh, like, instantly. It's crazy the, how fast things happen here. Yeah. I haven't really caught up. No. Well, so if something was incredibly contentious, we would probably put it in front of our internal legal team. Um, I don't know of any example where we've gone for customer communications where that I've worked on since I've been here, where we've had to go and get approval from the FCA first. You kind of go through that at the previous stage when you're launching the product idea, and then the communications off the back of it, you should have the answers by then. Um, I don't know of any situation where we would have to. And in terms of if customers come back and say, this is rubbish, what's going on, then, like, yeah, within hours, minutes sometimes. Yeah, very fast. Too fast. Yeah. Or 
Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, the reason was because when we were asking that question internally, it was kind of a casual thing that came up as part of a conversation. It wasn't part of a concerted drive. It was just an interesting thing that got surfaced. Um, I think it would be interesting to go out to the community and ask them what they think, but I'm also very aware the community are a fantastically engaged group of people, but they are a small group of people of the over half a million customers we have at the moment, and I wouldn't want to be swayed too much by what they say. I would like to do an experiment or some kind of experiment where it's more like we do more in-app things that cover more people, and that's definitely something we're looking at. Um, in the meantime, I think we can get kind of like a, a bias going of people internally saying the same things to each other and then we're just confirming each other's original ideas. Yeah, please. Hey, Harry, um, you've got, the model's got great um, international expansion plans. How do you propose taking the term voice and adapting it? Because two different, well, one sentence between two different things yeah. in English and two countries. Like yeah. US. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a really good question. So the, the long-term difficult thing at the minute, or the interesting thing that I'm thinking about for the very far future is exactly that. Like, how do you take what we've got in our tone of voice and what our values are, and then you translate that into American English or Australian English, let alone into Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, like, how do you do that stuff? Um, so one thing is, like you say, you can't just translate. You can't just take one sentence and put it into another language. We use so many idioms and metaphors in everyday speech that we don't even realize those things are there, and they just don't translate across. Like, the slightly pretentious industry term is transcreation. Like, you take an idea behind what your principles are, and you say, what does that mean in Spanish? So if we say that we're friendly and transparent and inclusive, what do those things mean in Spanish? And then you go and ask a Spanish speaker, what does that mean? And then you, you believe what they say, because they're smarter than you. Um, in terms of the American English thing, I think it's interesting. One of the things that would be really interesting is if we end up with customer service teams in different locations around the world, maybe that's part of the, the interesting experience. Like at this time in the morning, you know you're going to talk to some people from South Africa. Or at this time in the evening, it's people in the Philippines. Like, I, I don't know, that would be really interesting. And we, maybe we could fold that into our differentiation. Because one of the things specifically in this tone of voice is that we're not trying to get to a point where we all sound the same all the time. Um, I, lots of companies do try and do that. It never works because there aren't that many people who can write the same way all the time. Uh, and also, it kind of, when there's a place where there's lots of interesting people with interesting ideas, I think that tends to dampen it down. So I think embracing a little bit of the differentiation would be interesting. And then when it comes to the language barrier, um, like getting local people to say, well, what does this mean in your language? Not, here's the thing, put it through the translator. Uh, yeah, please. Have you seen a reaction from your competitors? To the tone of voice stuff? It, well, it literally went live about three hours ago. <laughs> so no, I haven't seen anything yet. Um, I don't know, maybe there will be. I don't know if um, any of the others have tone of voice guides. I've not seen any publicly published. Why you write generally? I haven't personally, no. I would be lying if I did. Yeah, please. Yes, okay. Uh, with the recent news about Cambridge and the litter cap, how is that going to affect how terms and conditions are written by yourselves and how you think uh, users will read them? That's interesting. Uh, I hadn't given it any thought. It feels like very far out of the realm of what we're doing or what we might be doing. Um, we are doing a big drive, obviously, for GDPR to make sure people know about the data they're getting and the data they're giving and how that works. Um, our terms and conditions just went through that review process, and as far as I know, we're, we're fine with the legal content of them. I don't think there will be anything else. Um, it honestly hasn't, hasn't crossed my mind, really. You mean in terms of how they respond to us? Um, not particularly. I mean, those examples of things where I was saying proof of funds and things like that, um, when we sometimes slip into that slightly formal tone and say we require proof of funds, they will say, I will endeavor to provide you with the proof of funds. Like, people reflect back the thing you put out a little bit. And we kind of do this, like we as in people in the world kind of do this. When you go and talk to a company and they get a bit formal, you tend to get a bit formal in response. So that does happen. But when we write naturally and clearly, people tend to respond in that way, and that tends to be the way it, it works. Yeah. Yeah. How do you review writing internally? How do we review writing internally? Um, it depends, really. Some things get reviewed, some things don't, because, like I said earlier, we're quite autonomous teams. Um, 
some things will have involvement from somebody who is a, the writer or at least the designer on that all the way through. Sometimes it will just be that we've run training and we trust that team to go off and do their own thing. It isn't standardised that there are kind of gates that people have to go through. Um, I would love it if we never had to get to that point. That's kind of the point of the training and support. Um, otherwise, it will just be kind of running it by me or one of the other people who does the writing stuff internally. Um, companies that do this well, companies that do the small print detail stuff really, really well, the obvious example that's not going to surprise everyone is Innocent, like they do do that stuff really well. Um, I think the reason people respond to them so much isn't necessarily because of what their tone of voice is, but because it's everywhere. And that's kind of the thing, like in my old life, we'd have clients come to us every few weeks and say, oh, we've heard about tone of voice, we'd love a tone of voice. Uh, we've heard Innocent have a good tone of voice, we'd like Innocent's tone of voice. And we go, okay, it's interesting, so what do you do? And I say, well, we make ICBMs. <laughs> we say, well, thank you, no thank you for your business, but also maybe the tone of voice of a drinks company that started in a field and give 10% to charity isn't the one for a weapons manufacturer. <laughs> and they go, oh, right, I hadn't thought of that. Um, because that's the thing that makes them good is the consistency thing of it. In terms of companies that have a particularly interesting tone of voice, I'm more interested in the ones that do it all the time because otherwise it just feels like, oh, that's, that an agency did that, that's nice. Like, if it's true, it's everywhere, and if it's not everywhere, it's not true, and there are very few of them, if any, that I know of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wondered if you guys have been deliberately kind of looking in that interplay between sort of just words in what you're doing, because I just see it a lot in your stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the question is, um, like, very kindly saying that the interplay between visuals and words and what we do is very nice and we have like a strong visual identity in the brand yes for sure and do we consciously put those things together yeah definitely so anything that comes out that is going into the app or anything like that will have designers and maybe a writer working on it um, and yeah we work really really closely together the design team here is great they are great writers in themselves no one here ever uses law and Ipsen and placeholder stuff like we always plan it with the actual content in mind which really helps there's no kind of back and forth fighting there. Um, yeah, I don't think one necessarily works properly without the other. Um, I'm not very good at the other, but um, I definitely like see the value in it and working really closely with the designers is an important part of it. Yeah. So how do you convince people who don't think of themselves as writers who might have no interest in it that actually the words that they are producing make a difference, like developers writing microcopy and stuff like that? Uh, cattle prods is one. Um, but generally just getting up and like we have an all hands meeting in here every week um, and you can get up on stage and say look and present you a bit of this stuff to get people thinking about language is usually quite a good way of doing it. Um, some people are convinced by the theory arguments, some people are convinced by some cold hard numbers of this is the difference it makes, some people just you need to expose to them the weirdness of business writing and do that thing about requiring a Twix and they go oh right. Um, so there's a few different approaches. Um, the other way to do it is to kind of like do it every way you can and then eventually that group of people will turn around and be like oh my god something's happened here and we weren't part of it and then they they might come to you um that's worked in other places i've worked with two yeah two more questions then please or no more questions yeah hi so i experienced the like language thing firsthand when somebody from also explained ring fencing to me which was like super complicated and i was like what are you talking about but it was awesome um, I'm wondering, like, I know this is, like, pretty loaded as a question, but, like, if you had a key takeaway, right, like, loads of people suffer from this, engineers, like, find it difficult to explain what they're doing, like, people in finance, so many industries, like, what would be, like, your key takeaway for simplifying, like, the language we use on a daily basis? Like, what is one key strategy that you would recommend? Yeah. So the question is, what is the one thing that will fix writing? Is that the question? <laughs> I told you it was loaded. I gave you... Two Last question, please. Um, so, like... I think the thing that makes for really effective writing fundamentally above all else is empathy. Thinking about your audience. 
if you start from the position of going, who is this person or people, that I'm, who are these people I'm writing for, and going, what do they need right now? Everything else kind of necessarily flows from that. There isn't a one right approach to writing that will work for every audience. There isn't one kind of message that will resonate with everyone. If you go, right now I'm writing for these people, what do they need from me? That will pretty much always get you there because then if they are not financial experts, you know not to use the jargon. If they have double PhDs in physics, then you might be able to use a bit more. Like it helps you pitch your level. So like putting the audience first is the thing that companies will struggle with. We're all kind of in we're looking in one way or the other. We can't really help it. It's part of that curse of knowledge thing. Um, so thinking from that point of view, audience first is the the best one off trick that you can do, I think. Last question, Naji, we got time? One more? One more. Yeah. Do you often get surprised by the results of an A B testing or somewhere that's been completely unintuitive? Um, yeah. Do we get surprised by the results of A-B testing? Yeah, sometimes. There was one early on, which I think I'm allowed to talk about. Transparency, right? I'm just going to talk about it. So um, we are, we are um, trying to encourage people to use bank transfers instead of Stripe top-ups because it costs us more money, basically. Um, and the experience is roughly the same, but it's just a loss for us. So we wrote an A-B test of an email. One said, um, this is why you should use bank transfers. They're better. It means you know how much money you're moving from one place to the other, and that's good. That worked fine. And then we wrote another email which basically said, could you do us a favor? Like, this costs us a lot of money, actually. And if we're trying to create a better product and get to break even and do really cool stuff, this will help us get there. And that performed really, really well. Like 30% drop off in the people using Stripe for top ups. Um, and I think what's doing that is just being honest. You know, Companies are terrified of being honest and saying, oh, we have an interest here. Um, that one was surprisingly effective. Um, I think that's time, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Those are great questions. Thank you for coming. Thank you.